The goal of this movie is to show off a few examples of how to apply the rotational inertia equations. So to begin with, let's take this example of a pencil that's rotating about its uh, end, right at the end of the eraser there. And let's try to see if we can figure out what is the rotational inertia of this pencil. We'll assume that the mass of the pencil is capital M and the length is L. And we'll further assume that the mass is uniformly distributed over the length of the pencil. It's possible, actually, that the eraser might have a lower density than the rest of the pencil, but let's assume that it doesn't. And I've been careful to pick a pencil that isn't sharpened because um, if, I, if, if the end were sharpened, then the mass would not be uniform over the length of the pencil. Anyway, uh, how are we going to do this? Well, we have two equations at our disposal that are shown at the top of the screen there. And when we have an object that is a continuous object, like this pencil, we really want to use the form on the right, the integral form. And you want to imagine breaking up the pencil into little pieces. And you choose a piece, something that isn't special. That's kind of near the middle of the pencil. I probably should have chosen something that wasn't even near the middle so that it would really seem not special. But anyway, um, we'll say that that has mass dm and then it's at a distance r away from the axis of rotation. So how are we going to go about using this formula up here? Well, um, you know from calculus that you really can't integrate something like r squared dm because uh, the dm, it really needs to be in the form dr somehow. So I'm going to take this dm and try to work with it a little bit. And the way we do that is just by noticing that um, if you compare the mass of that little green bit that I've shown on the pencil there to the total mass of the pencil, so dm is to m, um, then that will be uh, the uh, compare with the length of that little green bit, dr, uh, and the length of the entire pencil. So in other words, dm is to capital M as dr is to L. And rearranging that equation, you get mass over length, big M over big L times dr is equal to dm. So I'm going to make that substitution into the formula. And now we have something that can be integrated because big M and big L are constants. And so we're really integrating r squared dr. Uh, the constants of integration are 0 to L because we're, we're adding up all of the r squared dm's over the entire length of the pencil, and that goes from 0, right at the axis of rotation, all the way out to the end of the pencil, so all the way out to L. And when you do that integration and simplify things, you find that the rotational inertia of the pencil about its end is 1 3rd ml squared. So for practice, what you might want to do is try to work out what the rotational inertia would be for a pencil about its center of mass. So in other words, imagine moving the axis of rotation to the center of the pencil. All right, so here's another example. Now let's assume or imagine that you have uh, a kind of blob of putty or something like that that has a total mass of m. And you break it up into four bits, each with mass m over 4, and put these four bits at the corners of a square. Um, and uh, you're going to imagine rotating th this whole thing about that uh, axis of rotation that I've marked with an x there in the center of the square. So it would look something like this. Okay, And to make it easy, I've labeled the distance from the axis of rotation to a single mass to be capital R. And so now we can go about trying to find the rotational inertia of this configuration. So what do we want to do? Do we want to use the integral form of the rotational inertia, or do we want to use the summation form? Well, in this case, since we have four discrete masses, it's really better to use the summation. And I know that each of my masses, each of my mi's, has mass m over 4. And each of them is at a distance capital R away from the axis of rotation. So I get four terms that are the same, m over 4 times r squared. And when you add those together, you just simply get mr squared. It's an interesting result. Um, and it gets more interesting than that. So let's say now that you take those m over 4s and you 
break each of them in half and spread them out, uh, distribute them uh, around uh, in a shape in which each of these little masses that now have mass m over 8 are at a distance r away from the axis of rotation. Well, what is the rotational inertia of this configuration going to be? So once again, it's best to use the summation form of the rotational inertia. And we're going to have eight terms. And each of the terms is going to be m over 8 times r squared. And when you add them all together, you get m r squared, the exact same result as we got in the uh, previous example. OK, so what if we change the example again, and this time we say, what's the rotational inertia of a hula hoop of mass m and radius r? So something like this. Um, we're going to be rotating about the center. So here's the axis of rotation. And um, you should, based on the last two examples, have some guess about what the answer to this question should be, although it is slightly different because now we have um, a continuous object, a continuous mass, and so we really want to break it up into pieces and use the integral form of the rotational inertia equation. So uh, we pick some mass that isn't special, some dm, and we note that um, it's at a radius capital R away from the axis of rotation. Now the reason I'm using capital R here is to emphasize the idea that no matter what dm I might choose on the hula hoop, it will be at a distance capital R away from the axis of rotation. In other words, R is really not a variable, it's a constant in this case. So when we substitute into the rotational inertia equation, we put in that capital R squared, that can actually be moved out to the front of the integral, and we're just going to uh, get that the rotational inertia is equal to r squared times the integral of dm. Well, what does it mean to integrate dm? You might think, oh, I've got to figure out what all these dms are. Well, not really. If you break something up into a bunch of little dms, and then you decide that you're going to add them all up again, all you're going to get is just m. And so the rotational inertia is m r squared for the hula hoop that is rotated about um, this axis of rotation. All right, here's the next example. Imagine now that you have a rotating disk and you want to find what is the rotational inertia of this configuration. So this is a disk that's rotated about an axis that runs through the center of the disk and is perpendicular to the plane of the disk and that green uh, arrow, actually the red arrows, the red arrow and the blue arrow, all of them are kind of giving you a sense of the um, the way that this disc is rotating. So here you might think, oh boy, we've got um, a relatively extended object here. Maybe we have to break it up into a whole bunch of tiny pieces, figure out, uh, you know, what mr squared is for each of those pieces and add it up. And um, you could imagine this being a pretty challenging problem. But actually, if you take advantage of what we've been noting in the last couple of examples, you can make the problem a lot easier on yourself. So what you want to notice is that if you make a hula hoop on the disk, um, it will uh, have some radius r, but every bit of mass on that hoop is at the same distance r away from the axis of rotation. And so uh, the rotational inertia of the hula hoop is equal to whatever its mass is times r squared, that, the radius of that particular hoop. So what we're actually going to do is break the rotating disk up into a whole bunch of rings or hoops, and um, we're going to integrate in that way. So we're still going to use the um, the integral form of the equation, and what we really, the, what the job really is now, is to figure out what is the mass of one of those hoops. So once again, we're going to apply this ratio trick and say, all right. So if we compare the mass of um, the ring there or the hoop to the total mass of the disk, that should be equal to the area of that ring times the, or sorry, divided by the area of the disk. So dm is to m as da is to a. And it might seem like um, this isn't much of an improvement, but it turns out that it, it helps out a lot. So first of all, I'll make the substitution in this equation. So now we have the integral uh, of r squared times 
times mass over area times dA. And I do have limits of integration on here. R is going to range from zero to capital R, in, order, in other words, from the center of the disk out to the edge of the disk. And there's still a little bit of work to do. Now we have to figure out what the area of the ring is, or the hoop is. Well, that's actually not as bad. Um, if you imagine snipping that ring and uh, kind of stretching it out, it would have length 2 pi r and width dr. So I'm going to make the substitution for dA, 2 pi r dr. Um, and now I've got some constants, the 2 pi and the mass over area are constants. Um, and so we need to... Um, Oh, and uh, sorry, and the area is also pi r squared, so I'll make that substitution and uh, kind of clean things up. And we find that the rotational inertia is 2m over r squared times the integral from 0 to r of r cubed dr. And um, I will let you do the, uh, do the integration there, but when you work it out and do the simplification, you find that the rotational inertia of the rotating disk is 1 half m r squared. Okay, so now we've seen a couple of examples of um, how you go about finding the rotational inertia of extended objects. And uh, people have done a lot of these calculations and you can do them too, but you might find that it's useful to have a table that gives you the rotational inertia for the most common objects. So for example, um, you're not going to want to have to re-derive the rotational inertia of a disk every single time you have a problem that involves a disk. You want to just have a table where you can go and look it up. And so this is a table that includes lots of the common shapes and gives you the rotational inertia of those common shapes. And um, the thin rod about an axis through uh, one end perpendicular to the length is the pencil. And we have seen that already. And I suggested that you might like to try to derive the rotational inertia for the pencil about its center of mass. And that's on there as well. So you can you have an answer to that question now. Um, and uh, so anyway, this is a useful kind of a thing to have, and it's it ends up showing up in, in every introductory physics book. So um, it's not like you have to have this particular table, but tables like these are very common. So uh, one more thing, there's this, there's this kind of convenient um, theorem called the parallel axis theorem that allows you to um, find the rotational inertia for lots of different things um, based on the rotational inertia of the center of mass. So the parallel axis theorem goes like this. The rotational inertia of an object is equal to the rotational inertia of the object about its center of mass plus the mass of the object times the distance between the center of mass and the axis of rotation squared. So for in this example that I'm going to show you now, we're going to use the parallel axis theorem to find the rotational inertia of a pencil uh, about one of its ends. We've done this problem already, of course, and so it will be nice when we see the same answer. So if you, um, so this is the center of mass, and in this case, h is here. It's the distance from the center of mass of the pencil to the axis of rotation. The red dot on the eraser is the axis of rotation. So um, if you go back to that table that I showed you, or you go to a table in a, in a textbook, you will find that the rotational inertia of a stick about its uh, center of mass is 1 12th ml squared. So I'll make that substitution. And uh, what is h in this case? Well, uh, it's going to be half the length of the pencil. So I'll make that substitution as well. And then if you simplify, you will find that the rotational inertia is 1 3rd ml squared. We have found this already, but that happens also to show up on, um, in, in the table that I showed you in the previous slide.